reach these uh, events and we see them uh, coming up in our lives, Lord God. We would not be uh, afraid or surprised, Lord, but we would be, um, Lord, developing a, a deeper longing relationship with you. Lord, we thank you that uh, it is that which will protect us in the last days. It's righteousness and faithfulness. Uh, Lord, while the world seeks for answers, Lord, we know that your truth lies in your word and that your power is in your hands. Uh, the power is in your hands, Lord. So we thank you that as these things come approaching us, we know that it's, it's for the birth of a new age, the age of the kingdom of our Lord. And uh, Lord, we don't uh, seek to be troubled or afraid as you told us. Lord, help us in our weaknesses. Help us when we become afraid. Help us to when we look at these things and we become fearful of what man can do, Lord. And help us to remind ourselves, Lord, that you told us not to be afraid of men, but to be fearful of you, Lord, to have a fear of you because you protect us, because you're able to provide for us and to be in awe and to be in reverence toward you. And these things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. I don't, normally don't title um, prophecy updates much, but tonight we will title one. Strong delusion, strong delusion. And I'm more convinced that more than ever that uh, our country, as well as Europe, as well as other parts of the world, are in a very strong delusion, not only spiritually to the things that are going on, uh, but all those things have a physical manifestation to some degree or another. The West is in a strong delusion. Turn to Matthew 24. We'll begin there on our prophecy update. Matthew chapter 24. And we're just going to look at one aspect of it, one aspect of delusion. But Jesus warned us about this. Matthew 24, Jesus comes out of the temple and he was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him, verse 1. And he answered and said to them, verse 2, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon another which shall not be torn down. They were going to experience a cataclysmic event of their own time. 70 AD was coming. And he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, and the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus said to them, See it that, that nobody misleads you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and will, dis, uh, will mislead many. And you will be hearing of wars and rumors of war, but don't be afraid. Don't be frightened by these things. For those things must take place, but the end is not yet. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. In various places there will be famines and earthquakes, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. The beginning of birth pangs. And then he goes on to explain the false prophets will rise up in the church. He first talks about deception in the world, lies in the world, and we truly are in the midst of that. And he talks about false messiahs in the world. He hasn't talked about the church yet. That happens in verse 9. False prophets are coming into the church. False messiahs are into the world. False messiahs will be people that will claim to have some kind of savior mentality. Trust me. If you follow me, I will save you. Vote for me. Uh, proclaim me as your leader, and you will be OK. Remember, I mean, this is not in the church yet. The church begins in verse 9 and things like that. But he's talking to believers about the deception of the world, in the world. Strong delusion. We'll go to 2 Thessalonians in a minute. But it's a strong delusion in the world. The blindness has fallen into America very, very deep. I don't know what it'll take to wake her up, except for maybe one catastrophe or a great revival. You pick one that you like. I would like the revival part but I'm more convinced than ever that it may have to take a tragedy in order to maybe wake some of people up. We thought 9-11 was the wake-up call. Soon after 9-11, and the churches were filled for a few months, people got saved, praise the Lord, but then America went about its business and continued on in the same trajectory that we are in today. Um, unfortunately, looking back 16 years ago, it's probably gotten worse. There was no revival. There was nothing that happened. People got saved, praise God. Some people did. People woke up. Not a lot, but it did. Does it have to come to something like that? I don't know. But I'm hoping that the Lord will have mercy and not justice for us. 
Turn to Isaiah 66. I want to uh, talk about this very quickly. The deception in the world, Isaiah 66, and look at verse 4. And if this is regarding hypocrisy that the Lord rebukes. He rebukes nations, rebukes people, rebukes individuals, but nations that knew him but turned away from him. Isaiah 66, 4. You remember in the, in the Old Testament it says, Blessed are the nations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. When righteousness is in the land, people get excited. It's a, it's a blessing. When the opposite happens, it's a curse on, God's, on, on the people of the land when there is unrighteousness in the land. You pick which is in our land today, righteousness or unrighteousness. So I will choose their punishment, the Lord says, and I will bring on them what they dread. Because I called, but no one answered. I spoke, but they did not listen. And they did evil in my sight and chose, that is, which I did not delight. Isaiah 66, 4. I'll read it again. So I will choose their, uh, their punishment, literally their treatment, their judgment. I will choose, it says the Lord. Isn't that kind of scary, isn't it, to think that God chooses the way you're going to be dealt with, your punishment? I will bring on them what they dread. What is the nation dreading the most? Because I called and no one answered, I spoke, but they did not listen. But they did evil in my sight and chose what is, uh, that which I did not delight. Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. Hear the word of the Lord. So there's hope for those who listen to the word of the Lord, but those who choose to do evil in his sight and choose to do what he doesn't delight, God will choose the punishment. Very clear in Isaiah. Now these are uh, messianic chapters, messianic uh, kingdom, messianic kingdom passages, what we will call them, regarding the messianic kingdom of the Lord, but it is clear as it is that God is in control of all history. And the nations that do well, God blesses. The nations that turn away, God judges. That, that's for individuals as well, but mainly in the, in, the, in the prophets regarding nations, regarding nations. Now, you take a look at where our nation stands, and uh, you dread what does our nation dread the most? And the Lord says, uh, I will bring on them what they dread. It's a very, very difficult passage. Oh, pastor, can you just go to Philippians chapter 4 and talk about all those beautiful psalms? And uh, Those are equal to the word of God, but we have to deal with all the passages in the word of God. The whole counsel of God is true. And what's applicable to us is a nation that's turned away from God. Um, God bless America. Yes, I do pray for America. I do pray for our nation. Uh, but I also know our nation has turned away from God. And it's turned away from the, uh, from the faith of our fathers, you would say, is what the Lord told, um, what the Lord told uh, um, Israel, the faith of their fathers. Now, um, lies and more lies, the strong delusion. Let's look what the strong delusion looks like. This was highly unreported, was not reported, um, but there was a five-year-old girl who was sexually molested in Idaho. How many have heard that news? All right, it's a few of you. When did it happen? June 2nd. How come we didn't hear about it? Because largely covered up by the cops, largely covered up by the media. It did happen in uh, Twin Falls in Idaho. Uh, a, a gang of Muslim immigrants uh, raped a five-year-old girl. She was, uh, um, had a um, learning disability, so she was already a special, in special needs. And um, they took her and they molested her. They uh, sexually assaulted her. And um, cops and the media hid it for, it just came out a few days ago, but it had happened on June 2nd. But you know what it is? They said, well, you know, we're not sure what they did to her. We're not really sure. And then we can't really know. Maybe they were provoked by something. And uh, this is not the face of, of Islam, they said. Again. Now watch the delusion. Watch the delusion. Um, when a country, a nation, rejects the word of God, rejects God, the only thing that's left, there's only one alternative, by the way. Do you know that? Uh, you guys know that because you know the Bible well. But the world thinks it has an, another alternative. We're just going to be secular. There is no country that can ever remain secular. Uh, Russia taught us that. China taught us that. 
There is such thing. Uh, there is no such thing as um, neutrality or uh, just atheism. No God. It'll go one way or another. If you reject God, there's only one other choice: darkness, the devil, the enemy. There's only one other choice. It's either Christ or, in the future, Antichrist. That's really all there is. First John puts it this way: You're either a child of God or a child of the devil, that's what it says. You know, people get all worked up about it because, you know, my grandma's not saved, my mom's not saved, and how can you tell them they're children of the devil? The reality of it is there's only two seeds. The seed of God and his word in us causes us to be born again. And there's another seed, the seed of darkness. Now, nobody would admit that. I didn't admit it when I was in darkness, but the Bible taught us, and I could look back. I can see it in hindsight. But people that reject the word of God, there's only one alternative. And this nation has chosen the alternative. After all of our opulence and all of our, um, it, you know, our, 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 our blessings and all of the things that we accumulated as a nation, richest country in the world, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. We have lived on bread alone for quite a long time. And then a nation that forgets the Lord begins to, it's not enough. It's not enough to have bread alone. We need God. We need the word of God. We need the right word of God. And unfortunately, what takes the vacuum in this place is Islam. Uh, we've been saying it for quite a long time, but Islam, it's very, very prevalent now in our world. It's some of the things that people talk about the most. And uh, with all the events going on in the US and Europe and the world, it's a judgment on America. It's a judgment. God will bring a judgment, he says. I will choose your punishment, he told the nation of Israel. I will choose it. And God definitely chooses it. How did this happen? Because you rejected God. How did, that, how, did that, how did that happen to this nation that once knew the Lord? Well, Islam is built on lies. And so those who love lies will embrace it. Very simple. Islam is built on lies. And if you love the lie, you're going to embrace the lie. 2 Thessalonians 2. Now we can go there quickly. Now, this happened in Idaho. People are saying, oh, no, no, don't worry about it. They're just making it up. It wasn't that bad. It wasn't that, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the, the media is blowing it out of proportion. Well, this week, or was it earlier this week? Or was it, I can't remember what day it was. Um, Sergeant Rodriguez, he was a retired Air Force. Uh, was, uh, I was going to bring a video, but I didn't bring the video. Uh, just to keep things speeded up a little bit because we've got so much to cover. Um, he was in a flag ceremony. And because the flag ceremony mentions God several times. Has anyone been to a flag ceremony? I have. And they fold the flag and he talks about how the flag is and 13 stars and what they mean. And it's one nation under God. Indivisible, just as, you know, the way what we used to do <laughs> in school. Pledge of Allegiance and prayer. Um, well, I wish I could have the video. Maybe I'll play it after service. Well, he was basically removed from the ceremony, which he was asked to uh, give the reference to the, the flag and the Bible and God. He was physically removed from there because he mentioned God three times. This is the Air Force. This is our nation. Why? It's going to offend Muslims. It's going to offend atheists. It's going to offend people. Well, while the Muslims could rape a little girl, and you can't say it's, 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 you know, that's not the face of Islam. Well, you mentioned God. Oh, you got to get out. You got to. And nobody could say anything. And if you say something, you're Islamophobe. You are every phobe. <laughs> but people don't see it. Um, you remember that, uh, the, 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 the terrorist that shot up in San Bernardino? They didn't live too far from where Danny lives. Uh, Danny Isom, not too far from where he lives, but people had seen him. You know, they're making bombs in there, and people had seen, oh, yeah, they get packages all the time. Neighbors, oh, yeah, they get packages all the time. Why didn't you say something? Well, I didn't want to be looked upon as a Islamophobe, the lady says. <laughs> I didn't want to see be a bigot or a racist, so I didn't say anything. It's almost as if there's a cloud of anesthesia all over the land, spiritual anesthesia. Everyone's asleep. Nobody cares. Nobody really wants to get involved. And because if you say something, you might be called racist, 
Islamophobe, xenophobe, homophobe. Um, I mean, you say Christian now, you automatically are labeled. 15 labels come into someone's mind. You say Christian, you might as well say Nazi in some people's minds. <laughs> you say Christian, oh, he's against gays, he's against this, he's against that, he's against Islam. And that's what the world thinks. But you're there in 2 Thessalonians. I'm not there yet, but I'm going to get there. Look what it says, 2 Thessalonians 2, chapter 2. Now, regarding the coming of our Lord, brethren, verse 1, regard to the coming of Jesus and our gathering together to him. Clearly, that's the coming of Jesus for his church. That is the rapture of the church, the coming of Christ. Then you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or disturbed either by spirit or by message or a letter, as if it from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. The day of the Lord and the rapture are intertwined. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, telling those two things that are going to happen, the, the apostasy and the son of destruction. Uh, the day of the Lord cannot happen. The day of his coming cannot happen unless those two things happen first. Who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God, of object of worship, so that he takes a seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as he is God. Don't you remember that I was still with you? I was telling you these things. And now you know that restrains him, uh, so that in his time he may be revealed. For the mystery of iniquity is already at work. Only he who restrains him will do so until he's taken out of the way. Uh, there's a lot to be said on that, but I'm just going to skip a lot of portions of it. You can ask me another time about it. Uh, but of course, what was restraining the coming of the lawless one is the Holy Spirit. It's only God who restrains. And the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his coming, uh, the breath of his mouth, uh, and, and, and bring an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, one who's coming according to the activity of Satan, with all power, signs, and wonders, and with all deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them. It's a very difficult word in Greek to translate. A strong delusion is one way of saying it. Uh, a deluding influence, it's another way of saying it. So that they might believe the lie or believe what is false. Very interesting how it's worded in, in the Greek. It's not a Greek class, so don't worry about it. In order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure and on righteousness. So a few things. There is the mystery of iniquity. The mystery of iniquity. It's already at work. What is the mystery of iniquity? Anybody have any thoughts on it? Oh, don't ask me. I might call on somebody today. No. Mystery of iniquity. It's a mystery that's going to be revealed in the last days. It's always been at work. It's related to sin. It's related to the spirit of Antichrist. It is a deluding influence upon the world to turn people away from Christ. It's always been. It's always been at work. But it gets worse in the last days because it's now an influence. And in verse 12, it tells us God will send the strong delusion. When people turn away from the truth and have no love for the truth and uh, replace the truth, God will do it. Remember it says in Isaiah, who chooses the punishment? I don't. You don't. God does. For those nations who turn away from him, God does. He says, I will give unto you what you dread. What do you dread the most? Violence, craziness in the world, sin, unrighteousness in the land. He says, I'll give you that which you dread. He said, but those who tremble at my word, if he gives the hope, the hope is, hear the word of the Lord. Those who tremble at his word. See, God never just brings a judgment and says, okay, that's it, enough is enough. He always gives a way out. Always gives a way out. What is the way out in 2 Thessalonians 2? It's to love the truth. It's to love the truth. Now, the truth is Jesus. Jesus is the truth. And uh, we have to love the truth. If you love the truth, you have no worry about deluding influence, seducing influences. Of course, uh, this is a lot to be said on it because it's the apostasy and the coming of Antichrist that causes the apostasy, right? The lawless one, the mystery of iniquity. A lot to be said. This is not to, it's not a chapter on 2 Thessalonians 2, but it is to say a nation 
that goes against the Lord and believes lies. And we talked about lies here really, a couple of weeks ago. Lies in the world, right? It was last week. It just seems so far. <laughs> what are the biggest lies in the world? Wasn't one of them that we talked about? Islam is a religion of peace. And the people believe it. Is they such a believe it that it's almost like, it's almost truth. I mean, you go against it, you're, you're done. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, now, this has happened during Mr. Obama's administration. Came out after all these things have been uh, counted and tallied up. Obama's administration is on track to issue one million green cards to immigrants from countries where Muslims are the majority. According to uh, Homeland Security's Yearbook of Immigration Statistics, green cards were issued to 832,000 people from Muslim-majority countries in the first fiscal year of the Obama administration from fiscal year 20, uh, 2009 to 2014. So um, it's probably more now, but this is what they've tallied up so far. And um, uh, the foreign-born population in the United States hit a record high of 42.4 million in July, according to Friday's report. The 832,000 green cards issued so far do not include temporary non-immigrants visa for people coming in simply to work or for people overstaying their admission period. So you have a problem with Islam, you have a problem with violence, you have a problem with people that can't adapt to Western culture, who hate the country, who hate Christianity, who hate the Bible. Let them in. One million of them. And it keeps growing. I told you last week that he wants to spend 17000 per foreigner who comes to, uh, from Syria. Now, uh, this was another interesting article. I didn't put it in there, but it's part of it. Uh, it's been known now because Obama said he was you know, a big Christian in 2008. Um, I've had people here in this fellowship who don't come anymore, probably because I didn't lick their boots about Obama. And um, yeah, I told them, I said, this guy's a fake. He's a liar. It, it, it's, it wasn't hard to say. It wasn't hard to see it. Oh, no, he's a Christian. He's a Christian. Well, President Obama, uh, this is from his own administration. He's not a big churchgoer, they say. He doesn't go to church much. As a matter of fact, he, uh, he has more speeches addressing Islam uh, than he has uh, spoken about Christ or Christianity. According to Joshua Dubois, he's a longtime spiritual advisor. I wonder what kind of spiritual advising he gives. Uh, to the White House, to Obama, who led the, uh, the uh, White, Ho White House Office of Faith based in neighborhood partnerships during his first term. The reason Obama doesn't attend church is because he's worried that he'll detract attention from other worshipers' experience. Basically, he doesn't want to be seen at a church because he, people might want to get his autograph. Something like that. Apparently, that makes President's church attendance so distracting to others is a rarity. Uh, but previous presidents who attended services did not seem to cause that. Bush didn't cause that, and Clinton didn't cause that. Uh, even though they both went to church, it didn't help. But um, <laughs> Obama doesn't go because he doesn't want to distract you. you know, him, him being there, might, he, he's more popular than Jesus. I mean, he's so popular that people cannot focus on Jesus because he's there. Interesting. Now, speaking of immigration and Muslim immigration. Here's a picture of these three monsters. Uh, of course, uh, the middle one is the one who just caused the, 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 the shot up the nightclub, the gay nightclub in, uh, in Orlando, Mr. Mateen. Uh, but the idea that they're lone wolf, so this is the idea that they've been parading around, lone wolf, lone wolf. They just did it because they're, you know, they didn't learn English and uh, they're they were just so unsophisticated, you know, they fell through the cracks, you know, if we just would have given them more, you know, food stamp and we would have just given them more WIC cards, they probably would not have shot up the place. Um, and then they said, well, it's, it's got to be the guns, you know, if he, he, he had guns, so it's got to be the guns. Now, question, you know, in Islamic countries with Sharia law, they kill homosexuals, they hang them from, uh, they throw them off buildings and they hang them from, um, what do they call those things? I've seen them. Uh, no, not rafters. Um, pulleys, big pulleys, and they, they I, I forgot what they call them. Um, well, they throw them off buildings and they hang them. So maybe it's, it's not, uh, you know, it's, it's not Islam's fault, it's building's fault. You know, we have to building control and we have to have rafter control because, you know, they're the ones who killed Muslims. You know, we have gun control. I mean, that's what, you know, it, it's, 
it's only, it's only right that we have building control because that's where homosexuals are killed by, uh, by Muslims. So, so Muslims killed uh, in, uh, in Orlando with guns. There's got to be gun control. It's got to be control of all these things. But obviously, I'm being facetious. Um, Loretta Lynch, which is uh, the Attorney General, who has been really, really on a, on a vendetta this week, uh, the transcripts of the call was going to come out. Have you guys heard that? Transcripts of the call is going to come out. And she was going to doctor it because she said it had Islam, it had Allah, it had ISIS in his conversation. So we don't want that to be put out on the news outlet. So we're going to we're going to change it. So it, instead of Allah, Akbar, we're going to say God. So instead of he starts saying, you know, when he was pledging his allegiance to Alu, Aluha Akbar, which means God is the greatest, by the way. God is the greatest. Allah is the greatest, what they're saying. And there's a reason for it. It's not just a coincidence. He's the greatest. I mean, there's somebody who's challenging Allah, right? There's a reason why they put it that way. Allah who Akbar, I mean, God is the, uh, Allah is the greatest. The greatest among who? God of the Jews and, and Allah. So he is the greatest, according to that statement. That's what they're trying to say. Uh, we don't want him to say that. We want to sponge that off the record and just put God. And we, wouldn't want, we want to take anything off of ISIS because it'll radicalize other people, they said. Well, she got into a lot of trouble for it. I don't think she's changed her mind on it. But it's an uproar because it is straight deception. And people are saying, oh, that's a good idea. Doctor it up so people don't get excited that Islam is actually killing people. And people are going for it. Strong delusions. I said this before from this pulpit, this pulpit perhaps. When things don't make sense logically, reasonable, I know it's hard to find logic and reason anymore in our nation, but when things don't make sense like that, automatically say it's a spiritual thing. That's what the Second Thessalonians is all about. Second Thessalonians says, these things will not make sense in the last days so deep that it's actually the spirit of Antichrist. It is lawlessness. It is wickedness. It is the mystery of iniquity. It will not make sense to you unless there's a spiritual element and component to it. And this is what you find. There is, makes no sense for a nation, a continent like Europe, to invite their own death of their culture and people, invite them in. And when they do a crime, those who they invite in, they say it's our fault because we failed them. Huh? That's right. It's our fault. You know, they didn't learn the language, so we need, we need more ESL classes. You know, they're poor, so they, we need to have a better infrastructure. You know, ISIS is mad because global warming. <laughs> this is literally what the Islamic Democratic Party says. They say it is because they don't have infrastructure and resources in the Middle East. And, and they're angry because they're in the desert. And, you know, they, they, everybody gets mad if you're hot, you know. If you're hot in the desert and you have nothing to do, of course you're going to get angry. And so we, in order to, to stop the invasion, we need to build jobs in the Middle East, you know, burger places in Syria. And, and then they won't be so angry, and they will, won't attack. Now that is, I don't even know what to call it, but delusion. It is a spiritual delusion, and it doesn't make sense. Now, let's continue, because Loretta Lynch says, um, this is what she says. She says, we may never know the cause of why Mateen shot up the gay nightclub. We may never know the cause from the highest attorney general in the land, the one that would put me in jail if she ever decided to do something against pastors and Christians. That's what we may never know. What We may never know. I mean, who's to say? I mean, it could have been, could have been food stamps. I mean, he never had enough food stamps. That probably was it. I'm being facetious, but that is what you hear from a country that is devoid of any spiritual understanding, of any spiritual reality. And yet the only people who know are believers. And so believers are to be um, more outspoken and not afraid, more willing to share the truth, more willing to speak out the truth. Like, I'm not expecting all of us to stand up on a roof and have a megaphone. There are people called to do that, and they're very good at it. 
You and I may not be that kind to do that in that sense, but we could all give our testimony. We could all share the gospel. We could all pass out a track. We can all hold a sign. We can do something, give our testimony, right? We can all do something about that, but it's, t- it's not time to retreat. Jesus says, don't be afraid. But when you see a, a situation like this, people retreat. Christians get afraid, and Jesus told us, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body. But be afraid, be fearful of God, who can kill both, both uh, soul and, and um, body and soul into hell. And then he says, look, God is going to provide for you. Now, Jesus wasn't saying, look, God is so mean, you need to fear him. He's saying God is so powerful. He can actually do that. He has the authority to throw body and soul into hell. He says, are you worth more than many sparrows? Are you worth more than the lilies? Don't you know God cares for you? That's what he was trying to say. He's powerful and he can care for you. So don't be afraid of men. Be, af- be fearful of God. Now, some people are saying this is not the real face of Islam. This is not the real face of Islam. This doesn't happen. Now, it is true that a lot of Muslims are shocked at this. But the reality of it is they all would agree that that is what Sharia law, the Hadith, and the Quran says regarding homosexuality. There's no doubt about it. Even modern Muslims will say, yes, we agree with that because that's what we're called to do. I wouldn't do it, but that is what our religion teaches. There's no doubt about that. But, of course, there's always a uh, sanitized version of it. Now, uh, as I'm running out of time, I need to move very, very quickly. Uh, The uh, crisis in migration. The global migrant tie swells to 65 million people. There are 65 million people that uh, worldwide, that uh, it's either a refugee or fleeing their homeland. And this is by the end of 2015, so we don't know what's going to happen at the end of 2016. The United Nations said Europe's high-profile migrant crisis is worse than World War II when the war caused people to shift from one nation to another. Uh, this is actually happening from the south to the north. And I think I have a picture of it. Uh, there's a big controversy in Europe because tomorrow is the called the Brexit. It's the British exit plan. They have to vote on whether they're going to stay with the European Union or not. Long story, I won't, it'll take too long to explain. However, there's much prayer. Uh, I did speak to uh, Jacob about that, and he's praying that there'll be an exit. It would only be the mercy of God upon Britain to exit such a terrible situation they're in, the European Union. Now, there's a lot of people that don't want to exit, and uh, actually, one of their uh, part of their parliament, uh, her name was Jo Cox, was murdered over the weekend. Uh, she was part of the ones that said that they needed to stay. She was murdered. Uh, big issues in Europe. So it's 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 a lot to be said. I don't want to spend too much time on it. Maybe I'll take questions afterwards. But this is the the plan of Europe. These are the exits. These are the where people are going to from north, from south to north, south to north. And it's a huge immigration problem. And yet, Europe will continue to bring in migrants. And Germany leads the way uh, to a big, big, big problems in Europe. Um, Most people believe European culture would be decimated over the next 10 years um, because of the swelling of immigrants from uh, Islamic countries, that there will be no Europe anymore. There will be no Belgium. There will be no Sweden as we know it. Uh, I'm going to skip the Venezuela part. I'll come back to that, perhaps. Um, This is the part that got me really, really um, thinking a lot this week, because we had a uh, a very close encounter over Syria between Russian jets and American jets. They got tangled up in a sort of a dogfight, and uh, uh, the mainstream media did not report it. But we came very close to a war over Syria. Uh, it's, still a, it's still very close, a war over Syria, because I believe they're priming up for this. This was not an accident. This was a, uh, I stick my chest out, and they, you know, U.S. sticks their chest out, and Russia sticks their chest out. And when that happens, you know, men, as we know it, things get so tense, yeah, that it only takes one little incident, that it may not even be that big, but when things are revved up that hot, it could happen at any time. So people are very concerned because Putin has already revved up his army. It's right on the border of the NATO countries, like Ukraine. Uh, and Russia said it will use nukes if necessary. 
they made no qualms about it. Um, and this was going to be over Syria. Now, there's two front wars. There's one in Europe, which is Ukraine, Russia, NATO countries. And then the other one is in the Middle East, Syria, Iran, Turkey, and of course, the big player, or the, the, the little player, but the one that holds the most value in biblical prophecy is Israel. What I believe could happen, it's a domino. And I've always said this as a domino. People often look for Armageddon as the big war, and it is the final part of the peace. But there's little wars that start bigger wars. We've seen that in history. A domino effect hits, and there's no turning back. I believe one of these wars begin to, if one of these dominoes hit, we could be seeing prophecy fulfilled before our eyes. It could be Damascus being destroyed, like Isaiah 17 says. It could be Ezekiel 38 scenario where Russia, Turkey, Iran come into Israel. But I believe something needs to happen prior to that, and that is maybe another war that decimates one area or one power that is unable to help Israel. And uh, people have always said, where's the U.S. in prophecy? I have no idea. All I know is that uh, it's not by name. And, uh, you know, those people have this Babylon idea. I don't know. It, it, the Bible's not clear, so I don't make conjectures on it. But the, the main thing is Western powers, according to Ezekiel, seem to be on the sideline, unwilling to get involved as, the, uh, as Iran and Russia, Gog and Magog, seem to bent on destroying Israel. That's all it says. But all the players are there. Could this be the case? Could this be the problem? Could this be the issue? Now, ISIS will be destroyed. I can tell you that. It'll be destroyed, but not for the good. It'll be destroyed in order for Iran to take its place as the dominant power in the Middle East. And when that happens, according to Daniel, there'll be a great war, a great fight between the prince of Persia and those who protect Israel. The prince of Persia will dominate the, the area of the Middle East, the Shiite Muslims. It'll be a great confrontation with the Sunni Muslims. And Iran will have a free highway to get into Israel. And Israel is very, very concerned because Hezbollah, which is the northern terrorist group, it's right there waiting for their instructions to attack Israel. Now, Israel knows this, and they're very uh, furious about what our administration did by giving them millions of dollars of bonuses and programs so that Iran could get its nuclear weapon. And so the Middle East is, on, is, in, is in unstable conditions. So is our country. So is our country. While everybody is looking for something else, <laughs> and looking on to entertainment and sports and what we're going to do, you know. Uh, and there's nothing wrong in and of itself. But people are so distracted and so deluded by the mystery of iniquity that they can't really tell what's happening. And it's like the writings on the wall, like in the book of Daniel, and nobody could interpret it. What is this on the newspaper? I don't know. It's just a bunch of words. Israel, Hezbollah, Iran, Turkey. What, what is this? Only one person knew. That was Daniel. He knew how to interpret the words that God had written, and he was able to explain to the king what needed to be done. The judgment that happened on Babylon. Daniel predicted it, and it would happen, and it did. Now, Christians are the only ones who could see it. What are we going to say? Can we interpret it? Can we understand what it says? Can we know the signs Jesus said, you can tell the weather, you're good at it. But can you tell the signs of the times? Can you discern them? Well, it doesn't take a lot of intelligence. It gets, it's only discerned spiritually. Only those who are spiritual will know. That's what it takes in the last days. It's faithfulness above intelligence. It's discernment above so-called knowledge. We need to have the knowledge of the word of God and true discernment. But remember, Philippians says that the sermon is steeped in love. It's steeped in love. Let your love be with all knowledge and real discernment. Love for the truth, love for the word of God. Growing in his love will cause us to understand these things. Because we will be faithful, God will reveal these things to us as things get closer. But to the rest, Daniel says, they won't see it. 
the wicked will not know what's going on. Now, our calling is to bring people into his kingdom and to tell them about the kingdom of God and about Christ and about his atonement and about his resurrection, death and resurrection, and about his coming. That's the calling of believers. Make that priority in your lives. As you see the day approaching, that becomes a real priority in people's lives. It's not about the ball game. It's not about your job or career or what's going to happen. It's about living a holy life in the last days. In fact, the, the prophet said, that's going to protect you. That's really going to protect you is righteousness and faithfulness. You can have all the money you want, but that's not going to protect you. <laughs> you can have all the intelligence you want, that's not going to protect you. Only what's going to protect you is the grace of God and the righteousness of Jesus in you. That's it. So simple, so right, so true. But we live in a land that is doing this and they don't even know it. Willfully, blind, spiritually deceived. Man shall not live by bread alone. The U.S. has lived on bread for quite a long time without any reference to God. And we like it that way, don't we? As America, we like to just have our bread and not the word of God. And Jesus said, you can't live like that. Eventually, that vacuum will be filled in by something else. And it has. And it has. And so it is. Can't cry over spilled milk. We just have to move forward in Jesus. That's it. And strengthen those things that remain. Let's pray. Father, in the Jesus' name, we thank you for your grace and truth. Bring about, Lord God, a real revival in our hearts. Bring about, Lord, a, a real love for your truth, a real love for each other, a real love for you that will overshadow anything that we have in this world, that the most precious and most gracious thing and the greatest thing we have is a love for you. Lord, we ask you that you immerse us in your love today as we study your scripture about this song, the song of all songs, the song of Solomon, about the love of Jesus, his love toward us, and our love for him. In Jesus' name, amen.